Cliff Rendering. Thank you. Uh, thanks for making time to be in this room instead of the big one. Uh, this is the end of the day, I know. I only have 150 slides to go, so feel free to interrupt. OK, how to get your CFP accepted, the case study? So it helps if your project is established, has 100 million of users, has changed the world, it has a community around it, many high profile users, and it's booming. It fail. <laughs> if it's experimental, unused, will change the world in the future, no community, no users, and hasn't been touched in over a year, you will get access. <laughs> so, <laughs> next point submit. For, for those of us from the other hemisphere, most of the time the CFP ends while we are in the middle of GRADAC, drinking. So make sure you submit. And how to keynote LG, uh, LCA? I was going to ask Matthew Garrett. Oh. OK, so Gliffy, uh, an experiment in GPU accurate text rendering with GLES2. Uh, so how do we render text right now? Basically, what we do is we we modify these glyph shapes on the CPU for their transformation and font size. We rasterize it on the CPU, upload to a GPU texture, and play. The problem is, if you want to change the font size, you have to redo this again. So if you have animating text, you have to re-rasterize every glyph, every frame, upload it, render it, next frame. So let's do something better. Hey, 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 that's mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the problem is many, many smart people have spent like 20, 30 years thinking about this problem. So if they couldn't solve it, uh, why, why do I think I can? So something had to give, and we figured, let's figure out what we can do better on high resolution displays. So when we started, we were thinking about 200 plus, maybe even 160. These days, the phone in my pocket has 445 DPI, so let's say 300 plus. So this is what we get from the font, uh, an outline in Bezier's, uh, second degree or third degree Bezier's, and our job is to transform this into pixels on the display. Now, what we have been doing for the past 30 years, everyone does on the CPU, is what we call coverage-based anti-aliasing. So basically, you draw the pixel on the shape, see how much of the, how much, what percentage of the pixel is covered, and you assign a number, a, a shade of gray, based on that coverage. The problem is, again, this is you can only do it for the same transformation. So there's this other thing, SDF-based anti-aliasing, and I'll get to SDF in a second. The idea is, uh, imagine the pixel is a, is a Gaussian. It's just a hollow. Now, Which they used to be. Yeah, exactly. They used to be on the uh, old displays. Now, with new displays, they actually are uh, rectangular, but we are moving to this model now. But hold on a second, we get to that. Remember, we have 300 DPI. And if OLPC and Pentile could get away with rendering to those funky pixels that no one noticed, we're good. So now, if, if you have this pixel that is round and circular, and if you can find the distance to the outline, and this distance is fine, meaning it's positive if you're outside, it's negative if, if you're inside, then you can just assign a number based on the distance. That's sign distance field based rasterization. So this is the sign distance field of the glyph. Positive on the outside, negative on the inside. You pass it through a smooth function, you get, you get your anti-alias rendering, right? The nice thing about this is you can make it blurrier or sharper. Shift it to get bolder or lighter. So. I know, I know, but you can. <laughs> right. So the kind of smooth function you use uh, changes the kind of anti-aliasing you get. The first top one assumes a perfectly rectangular uh, pixel, and your scanning aligned to the pixel. The second one is uh, the smooth step function of OpenGL. It's a basically second-degree continuous, but not at the corners. The third one is uh, second degree continuous all over. And the last one is uh, the curve you get if your pixel is exactly 45% rotated. So even if you assume a pixel that is uh, rectangular or square, you can mix between the first and last depending on the angle of the pixel. This is what I do, but makes no difference, really. You can't see the difference. 
So the nice thing about SDF is it is linear over uniform scaling and translation. So if you have represent your SDF once, it's just linear math to, to scale and move the, uh, the image. Now the problem becomes how to represent this SDF on the GPU. Now what problem have, uh, so normally what people do, rasterize to a texture, this is kind of a rasterization, upload it, upload it. So when they want to use the SDF, they put the SDF on the texture. So you, you sample the SDF, put it in a texture, on the shader, you bilinear interpolate the SDF. The problem is, again, when you zoom in, you get the same visual sampling effects. You, you lose sharp corners, you get bumps, it just looks bad. But game developers love it. So let's vector all the, I don't know if vector is a word, but so we want to put actual vector data on the GPU. So the problem, distance, computing distance to Bezier is hard, really hard. Like for a third degree Bezier, you have to solve a fifth degree polynomial. Now again, like any other computer geometry problem, Jim Blin has a solution to it. There's a, <laughs> <laughs> there's a heuristic, but even that is too complicated, too complex, too heavy. So what we do instead is, ouch. So what you can do, convert to line segments. That's what we do on the CPU. It works fine, but the problem is you get this kind of thing again. So the alternative I want to pursue is convert to circular arc, arc, arc splines. And they look much better. So now we have a glyph, which is a Bezier spline. We want to convert it to an arc spline approximation, right? So first we need an error function. So this is your, say, curve, a circular arc you want to fit, and now I want to know how bad that is. So that's that I developed. Then I developed a physics simulation uh, model to, to use as many arcs as necessary to, to achieve a certain tolerance. So this is kind of what you get, a bunch of arcs. And uh, looks much better, this is all arcs. The number of arcs you get is about maybe 50% more than the Bezier, which is amazing. So GPU time. So stuff it all on the texture, ship it on the GPU for every pixel, find the closest arc. It's worked. First time I presented this, it was running at three frames per second, and each glyph took 50K of uh, GPU memory. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, OK, I only need to make it 20 times better. And, <laughs> and people asked me, the first question after the talk was, do you think you can do it? So people thought I was insane. So yeah, you're insane. So, there's a lot of overlap corner cases to get those to just show up. There's like overlapping contours. If the two arcs are tangent, you, get, you can mess them up. They can cross each other. The float precision on the GPU. So yeah. So now what we want to do is to, ha to have fast random access to the closest arc. So what we do is we put a coarse glyph on the, on the uh, a coarse mesh on the glyph for each item, we just care about the arcs that may be closest arc to some point in this grid cell. And then various optimizations. So again, this is the line with the arcs, and the, the, shade, the shade of gray here uh, shows the number of arcs that may be closest here that we care about. So it's one most of the time, it's two sometimes. So this is a glyph. The, the green shade shows the number of arcs we care about. So you see around here, uh, there's so many arcs that may be closest. In fact, no matter how fine you go, there are points that are closest to many arcs. But the problem, the thing is, the nice thing about it is, pixels are so small, we don't really care if something is 20 pixels away. So for these areas, we can just throw them away like this. So for this area, we don't care. It's just too far. Well, here. This is too far away from any, any arc. We don't care. So the shade here uh, show the number of arcs we care about. Here you see it's most, it's like two, two here, three. And here you see one of the optimization. If the closest arc is, there's only one arc and it's a line, we, we have stored it very efficiently. So you get the glyph again. And now, now the rhetoric changes. It's insane. <laughs> so demo time. I don't know, you changed your shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, this is my system monitor. Uh, this four core they still keep working, but uh, Cliffy demo. Well, let's make it a bit bigger so we still can see this. Okay, so this is like every single pixel, every frame is being rendered on the GPU, nothing on the CPU. The only thing the CPU does at every frame is if you're animating, just change the uniform to set the matrix. So I can move it around. Oh, if I'm lucky, I can zoom it. Oh, I'm not lucky. Yeah, I can zoom it infinitely. Let me bring an R. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay, you kind of see some artifact here. Okay, you proved your case. <laughs> but no, the arts actually don't uh, blow away. So this is the debug info. You see the distance field, the number of closest arcs, the arcs themselves. You know, I don't know why the gamma prediction is really bad. <laughs> anyway, so, and if we go back here. That, that may be the cliff shape. Here? No, the right, right, the right stem. Okay. Like here, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just uh, bits. I store X and Y using 12 bits. And then uh, the arc and line use different uh, storage, so the line and arc don't, don't line up. Okay, so back, uh, zoom a bit, and the nice thing is you can have projective transformation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, the thing to notice is there's nothing happening in the CPU. Okay, so let me, I'm getting ahead of myself, but <laughs> so the nice, as I said, this is, this is the, the SDF is invariant over a uniform scale, but if, if I scale it, uh, if I, uh, how do I do that? Okay, yeah, you see, you see the anti-aliasing on the x-axis is just too much. We have a fix for that. So, uh, and if we see what kind of frame per second we are getting. Yeah, something is uh, capping it at 60. I don't know what exactly, it can go faster, I'm sure. Oh, I have, but it doesn't help. That's the GLX thing. No, same thing. I used to get before uh, GNOME Shell and stuff. Oh, GNOME Shell, you need to turn GNOME Shell on. Yeah. So what else can we do? Well, OK, you said don't do it again, but. And of course, we can get a, oops, <laughs> no. <laughs> and can get outline for free. Okay, uh, I think that's all I have. Ga well, gamma adjustment, contrast, all those things I can change. Ooh, that's fun. <laughs> right. Gamma, let's see. It's, yeah. Oops. Yeah. Good luck finding the right value. What's that? Well, he's changing, he's changing the gamma function there. Yeah. He's not changing the thickness. Oh. Yeah. Okay, that's all it can do, basically. Yeah. Back to work. Okay, limitations. Main thing, memory. <laughs> 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 so now I've got it down to over about like 2K per glyph or better. That's not bad. No, and. Uh, I know, I'm going, I'm going there, I'm going there. <laughs> and uh, so I've got it under 2K and about two point something texture fetches per pixel. And now, if you have a single letter I or G, it's eight pixels by 16 on your normal display, that's only 100 bytes. But on this phone in my pocket, that takes 20 times more, more storage. So that's like 200K for one rendering, one size only. So I'm already way ahead of like if you have a 
couple sizes. The problem is speed and memory are font dependent on every pixel, every frame. So font complexity is carried along onto every frame. So we say, yeah, if you have something like this, this will actually work. It's not much worse. But, hmm? No. <laughs> That's something, monsieur, something. But the problem is people do this. <laughs> That's over a hundred times more complex than your no normal font. And when I try to render this one, the way I'm storing my stuff in a texture, I have a big texture, use it as an atlas with a width of like, I take 64 uh, pixels wide and go down. This one allocates, needs to allocate more than a whole column. So I don't wrap and it just doesn't work. Advantages, memory footprint, as I said. <laughs> so sub-pixel positioning is for free. Every, every pixel, every frame is sub-pixel positioned. Pinch to zoom is just normal. That's what this is designed for. So challenges, <laughs> talking to you, Eric. <laughs> so shader size complexity. When I started this, people were like, you're crazy. There's no way. Shaders are not for this. Pixel cost. Uh, again, when I was talking to one of the Android people two years back, they were interested. They said, on Tegra, on some Tegra, we can afford, for, to get 60 frames per second, we can afford one texture fetch, one multiply, four ads. And I'm like, okay, I need three or four texture and 100 times the operations. Dependent texture lookup, again, people say it doesn't work, you can't do on G ES2. So I need, I need to look up something based on that, go look up some other things. That's how my, my grid works. So the first entry into the uh, uh, fragment shader, I see where in the grid this is, get it, go fetch the arcs, go through the arcs, right? So variable loop iterations, it told me like the loop has to have a fixed uh, number of iterations. So fine, I cap it at 32, I break out of it. And interpolation accuracy, that's a, a more problematic one. So if I have variants passing from the fragment shader, the vertex shader to the fragment shader, and I'm, I'm using this for integer things, right? right? Those are like array indices and stuff. Looks like as soon as you have a projected, projective matrix, like even if the variant is the same on all the uh, corners, you lose one or two bits during the interpolation. <laughs> so just don't use the lower two bits. So this is what people used to call a complex frag fragment shader. And it's cool, it renders this. So mine starts this way, like any good open source software. This is my, so this is a shader library. So you're, you include the shader in your code and use it. So this is like the integration point. You define macros to, uh, to integrate. Uh, this is how I access something. You define this to access your texture. This is my main SDF. This part is only the optimization. If it's a single line, or if it's not close to anything, I handle it. Then I, I get ready for the actual for loop over the arc. And this is a for loop only, again, this is the optimization part. The actual going through every arc, this is the easy case, and this is the corner case. <laughs> and finally, you just return the main distance, signed. And it's run at this, right? So, drivers. <laughs> Canon world doesn't ex start it. Okay, case study. Metal software render actually used to render this at some point. <laughs> and then uh, it started saying infinite loop detected in fragment shader. And Eric said, just forget about it. I'm not going there. NVIDIA on Mac was, uh, has been so far the best, the best driver for this, uh, fastest. But again, every driver combination, every driver and operating system combination, we had to bring this up. I never got this bring up idea until I got here. For every single driver, we had to change things. And not, it's not like we, we were doing something bad. The driver was so broken. So in this case, apparently the, the shader compiler doesn't like token pasting. So I used to have token pasting so you could namespace my function in your shader, so I removed it. Uh, 150 plus frames on MacBook Air 2011. On the Retina, it goes about 30, so needs some speed up there. AMD and Mac, oh, the AMD compiler was even funnier. <laughs> so this code here 
was never getting run, just moving it into a function fixed it. <laughs> I don't know. Intel Linux, yeah, oh yeah. It used to just refuse to compile the drivers, then fail to spill registers. So Eric was nice enough to spend a lot of time and got this commit in. Uh, do you want to explain? No, I really don't want to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what was happening, if you had a loop, every, every variable access in the loop was uh, allocated registers and retained for the entire uh, life of the loop. So he just implemented some very basic compiler optimization things. And it's working. It's been working. <laughs> Yeah, it was so hard, I had to keep one version of good Mesa around. So it runs 60 plus, it, I'm sure it goes faster, it's just my GNOME shell. It's a two year old ThinkPad and uh, stock Ubuntu 12 something, 12.4. Uh, again, full HD display. I bought 3G, someone got it running on there. <laughs> it's like, run slow, three frames per second. I still want to see it on 5C or 5S. So Android 4.3, oh, driver bike. So these, the, the red lines of code used to correctly return one. If I used an intermediate variable, it was returning zero. There was just no hope for this one. Fortunately, I just had to wait. 4.4 fixed it. So well, I still had needed a single patch. Like this space here was was. Uh, if the space is there, the marker is not expanded. So easy fix. And it's been running 25 frames per second on Nexus 4 and 5 at uh, full HD resolution. I have it here if you want to walk over and test it. It also runs on the Nexus 12 2013. So the code is in libglyphy. is C++ with a C header, uh, like 2,500 lines of code, 300 lines of uh, shader. No dependencies whatsoever, no OpenG and no free type. You feed it the outline, it gives you a blob that you are supposed to take to the uh, texture, and then you get a shader source, you integrate it in your own shader and push it out. So the Glyphy demo is about 300 lines of code that's accessing the, uh, the font, laying out, then getting the blobs, uh, putting an atlas, uploading, and uh, using Cloud to drive the interactions. So subpixel rendering, we actually have it done. It's, it's not much more complicated. So you just need to change your uh, SDF to, instead of just returning the distance, return the vector, the direction to the closest arc. And then you have the direction, you have three subpixels, you, you approximate the distance of each of the subpixel uh, centers. So it's not three times the cost even. And the troping anti-aliasing, again, we have something close to it. It's not complete. The problem is, a circle, if you stretch it, it's not a circle anymore, right? And on the other hand, or the other way, uh, the way we, we, we calculate the distance to the circle is we calculate the distance to the center minus the radius, right? That just doesn't work for an ellipse. So, uh, but again, what we can do, we can get a vector to the arc, and then when we are uh, dot producting that with the pixel dimensions, the pixel now has a different dimensions in different directions. So you can kind of approximate that. Uh, so that's the main talk. Now I'm going to, maybe I was insane because I'm going to show you what we had to go through to actually get this to work. And we are good in time. I can go through this in five minutes, I think. So this is a letter. This is the SDF. That's with the uh, parts removed, parts that we don't care about removed. So this is a very coarse grid. I can go finer and finer, throw some away, even finer. So you still have those bright spots. So this is the SDF. This is the DF, distance field. I get the sign. Now, if you're not careful, you can mess up things. So if you have a point that is closest to two R corners, now figuring out whether you're in or out can be tricky. So that was the main first problem we had to solve. There's like tons of like, we had to solve 20 different issues to get it to work. So if you're not careful, all kind of crazy things happen. If you are careful, it's still some other crazy. This one actually, you, 
is a font bug. The font has two points very, very close, which should actually be one point only. So, oh yeah, this is interesting. So if I was to just use the SDF, this is the SDF, it's around here, right? But we have a mode to do something called pseudo SDF, which produces these sharp corners. Uh, I'm not going to say what that's used for, for but emboldening. Okay, so again, artifacts, uh, this is, if I remember correctly, float precision issues. If you're calculating the arc intersection, those things can go bad more. <laughs> okay, now, now it starts getting funny because you can get so close to being right and then this one arc is totally wrong. <laughs> So even this, okay, this is like, you see the discontinuity here. All kind of fun. Oh, this one again, see, it's almost right, but you, can, you get these two like flip. All kind of crazy <laughs> things. I call this the spooky G. <laughs> All over, like this one point happened to uh, overflow, I think. Yeah, it was outside the bound of something, overflow. Like all over, every one of these, like me or my intern had to spend days to, to figure out. And if, if the GPU, you don't have printf, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the Voronoi of the G, actually. Okay, and this is the patchy G. And uh, that's all I have, questions. And we have about almost 20 minutes. Go ahead. Do you handle kerning? Do we handle kerning? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so this is the thing. We don't do hinting, and you shouldn't really want hinting. But everything else, ligatures, kerning, funky uh, contextual things, those belong to the layout layer. So layout is Harfbuzz, my other project. So you give the text and font to Harfbuzz. It gives. It says render this glyph index here, and that's when the rasterization starts. So these are completely separate things. So yeah, we, we do that. Go ahead, yeah. Have, have you done any benchmarking in the other direction of a, a benchmark that keeps adding glyphs until you drop below 60 frames so you can get a measure of uh, glyphs that I do 60 frames? Uh, so the question is if we have done more benchmarking, see how, how much we can put on it. So uh, good question. The thing is, like the main work on this ended a year and a half ago. The problem at that point was there was no target for this to work specifically on uh, making it fast or major things. Because I don't see like the Linux desktop using it, well maybe with Wayland somehow. But it doesn't fit in the Cairo model, the Pango model, the GNOME model, the GTK model. Uh, and like the mobile GPUs were just not there. But now it's starting to get interesting because looks like mobile may, may be able to use it. Now, NVIDIA has released a demo or prototype of a mobile GPU that is faster or as fast as desktop. So it looks like, like two years from now, it may totally be running Android. So when we have that kind of target that I now have in Nexus 5, I can go measure things, see if it's the texture fetch that is causing the main like blocking or is it operations or texture memory or so no I haven't done but this is something I, I, I look myself as spending a good part of 2014 on this. Go ahead. Have you looked into using GLSL optimizer to feed optimized shaders to the mobile drivers? Interesting. So the question is if I've used a uh, shader optimizer to pass this through. No. Uh, is there anything other than angle? So it was um, the trader of Unity took Mesa's GLSL compiler and built a little driver back end that emitted GLSL code. <laughs> so he just took his shaders that his infrastructure was generating, ran it through Mesa, pulled GLSL code out the other side, and got huge performance wins on iOS. Hmm. So I should. Uh, he's still using it in his pipeline. I should talk to you about these, it. Yes. These mobile driver awesome. compilers. Uh, the other thing, yeah, but I forgot. No, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have um, one other observation, not, not really a question. All of these um, graphs that you're doing look suspiciously like the geometry calculations we do in Graph Snapper for calculating 3D printing how to lay down plastic. 
Yeah, the, a lot of the, so the, the comment was that a lot of this looks like what you do in 3D printing or other geometry. Yeah, I think arcs are very relevant to, uh, to whatever physical movements you yeah, have. And Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, so, so I, I've got to say the main idea of using arcs this way uh, was not mine. It was uh, fr uh, from a PhD thesis of someone at U Waterloo, and uh, they were looking into these things for generic uh, like uh, curve uh, rendering or SVG rendering on the GPU. And the problem with a lot of this is if you have detailed uh, uh, like images or sharp corners, a lot of this doesn't work. But for glyphs, it's much more well behaved. Yeah, I guess that's the other problem. You've got a constraint size with the glyphs, yeah. the generic object you want to print. Yeah, and you have like one color image at a time. You don't have a full SVG with gradients and stuff. But so if you do like treat the text by less than a pixel, quite often you see flashing when you render. So I'm yeah. Sure you can do that in your test program. Is it actually smooth and you don't see dark? Right. Light? So the question is, if we have a slow movement, does it jump or is it better? That problem, as you say on Cairo, for example, uh, which is in GNOME. I know you don't use GNOME. <laughs> so uh, Cairo's X and <laughs> Cairo's uh, raster backends don't do subpixel positioning, so they. They just round the pixel, uh, the oh. the image to to a pixel uh, boundary. So subpixel positioning is what we call being able to render raster differently based on your sub, and this is fully sub subpixel position. So right, but does it actually? So what often if, happens when you do subpixel is that depending on where it, letters end up, it doesn't actually sometimes look right. they look darker, sometimes they look right. Right, that darker. that's your gamma gamma correction. Yeah, you, you need to get the problem is. is that Use a linear, linear, linear yeah. gradient for the colors. The problem is your display is gamma, and so you actually need to use a gamma filter yeah. on the aliasing. Yeah. Are you doing that correctly? Yes. So, can so, you show us? Yeah. So, I think I. Uh, so, this is at the end. So, I'm showing uh, black and white. It's easy, but to do it correctly, you need to blend in a linear space. And there's a GL extension for that, right? For sRGB. Yeah. If you don't turn that on, you still can't get the full thing. Because, like, to do it really correctly, what you want is you have your uh, source value, get the destination, convert this into a linear space, blend, and convert it back. Uh, can I show it? I don't know how exactly to show that. Uh, it actually usually works better with small text. Yeah. Shift slow. I'm trying to see if I can. Uh, it's probably hard to, uh, I mean, the mouse. There's the, flickering from yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the mouse coordinates I'm getting, getting in the demo is like so pixel, a whole pixel. So I, I look into it. I, yeah, I haven't <laughs> produced demos for that. I know other people have looked into it using this to render very thin uh, slope lines at sub pixel positions. Yeah, that's something I need to, uh, yeah, produce more demos of. The code for the demo. Oops. It's not really that in. <laughs> that's okay. That's the other thing. Uh, I once managed to, with some version of mscripten, to compile this using mscripten to JavaScript and WebGL. I used to run just fine. <laughs> so the main problem, for example, on Android, the, it takes maybe a couple seconds to, uh, to come up. That's the shader compilation. That's the slowest part. So uh, the main. What? Three dot text. What? Your setup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like the main uh, driver just calling Glot to set things up. Uh, what I have here is. Well, I have a font abstraction, so that just uh, basically you ask it, you ask for a glyph, it gets a glyph from free type, feeds it into Cliffy. Uh, Cliffy. 
Yeah, this is the main part. So basically, you feed the arcs into the arc, the, the Bayesian into the arc accumulator, then uh, you get a, this function. It takes the arcs and cools it into a binary block that you then need to get to the GPU. Then I have a atlas, a very trivial one, basically. So I just keep, for every glyph, I know this is this rectangle in the texture is the binary plot for this glyph. So uh, for every glyph, I just produce two rectangles, like six points, and assign the uh, the uh, texture coordinates for it. I also, there's a 16-bit number that comes from the glyph. I need to pass that through to the vertex shader. I mean, that saves one texture uh, fetch. So then uh, my V shader, oops. So this is my V shader. Basically, it takes the matrix, uh, the glyph, Vertex. Uh, so what does it do? Okay, so it gets a glyph vertex info that has the corner. It says like x0, x1, y0, 1, y1. And then, as I said, uh, a certain number that is per glyph fixed, I need to uh, wire it through. And then uh, it gets a position like you do every, like in every shader, and then transcodes the data for the uh, fragment shader. And then I have the atlas. This is the integration part with uh, the library. This is the function that I give it, uh, like I, I use the 2D texture as a one directional array, right? So I say, okay, I want this point in the array and this uh, integrates it into my atlas. And uh, well, GL3 has a one DRA and those things, but we don't have here. Have you looked into porting to desktop GL? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you're doing here that's workarounds for. Yeah, it runs on desktop, but it doesn't use GL3 yeah, specific the, thing. Uh, extra buffer objects that look like you want in there. The, your, your attributes look like you had a flat attribute that you have trouble with the interpolation. Yep, so yep. Use the flat, uh, I know. The flat well, flat. In, that's <laughs> even that's not even in GL2, right? Uh, flat was GL1230, yeah, so uh, GL3.0. Right, I don't even have GL3. I don't have GL3. <laughs> well, because there's, uh, I don't see any target on desktop for this. If someone wants to use it, like if you have a platform that can plug this in, I totally look into it. But as I said, your general desktop. There are other people using it in SDL based or those kind of thin graph thing. The question is, it's, it's very much, very not, it doesn't seem like it's, it's environment specific, it's very application specific for applications that are doing massive text animations. Right. So yeah, my question is, what are, what are some good applications of this on the desktop? And the fragment shader, so basically, uh, these are the uniforms control all the bold outline debug stuff. So, and uh, this decodes the stuff that the V shader encoded for us. And these are the anti aliasing functions. Now, you notice I'm actually doing the square pixel here. So this is the axis aligned, this is the diagonal, and then it interpolates based on the direction of the uh, uh, pixel. Yeah, I should remove it. I don't know why I have it here. And this is the main. Uh, the main is basically, yeah, this much. So I decode the stuff, uh, get my pixel size. This is this gives me the pixel size, right? And uh, I get the distance from Glyphy, and well, I apply boldness, uh, anti-alias, adjust gamma, and just return. That's it. Now the debug mode, all those fancy colors, that's what's here. So uh, that's the demo. We have five minutes left. If one more, one question. Go ahead. How do you handle um, things like 
Arabic or Devangari with interconnected lives? So the question is how do we handle a complex text like Arabic Devangari? <laughs> it's a shame because I develop PowerPoints that does that uh, on your phone, Firefox, Chrome, GNOME, but Oops. Let me see. Five. One second. So no, it doesn't work right now because I haven't hooked up to Harfbot. But again, that's a shaping layout problem. It's on top of like before we get to Glyphinis. I should do it. <laughs> I know. Uh, Go ahead. I am. The problem is it's running good old shell. Yeah. Yeah. I tonight I look into that. I can probably boot into like logging into the old GNOME GNOME two uh, compat player. Okay. Any final comments or questions? No. It still looks crazy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, so do I release the code to to detect the bad shapes or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You know that code is in my Git history. <laughs> I used to when I was like the gallery images just are images I saved over a year and a half and. I was at some point I was tagging individual commits with like this is that image, but uh, <laughs> I stopped doing that. It was just so so much stuff. But like there's a date range. Any commit you check out has those uh, psychedelic images. Okay, thanks all. Uh, I can go drinking now. Yes. <laughs>